And uh, the headline is Federal Appeals Court Schedules Oral Argument in Case Seeking to Overturn U.S. Marijuana Prohibition, written by Ben Adlin yesterday. And this is a continuation of a case I, I covered uh, last summer, which seems like an eternity ago, given the election cycle we're in. But um, this comes out of Massachusetts, and it was filed by Verano Holdings, Cano Provisions, Wiseacre Farms, and it was filed specifically to challenge the Rates decision. That was the abomination that you know led to my imprisonment. And the, uh, a federal appeals court in the first district has scheduled oral argument for three days after the DEA's scheduled rescheduling hearing. And that's got the DEA's panties all in the knot now. Um, and what, what we have here is a case that is destined for the Supreme Court one way or another. The plaintiffs, Verona Holdings et al., if they lose, they're gonna appeal. If the federal government loses, they're going to appeal to the Supreme Court. And this case involves how far can you stretch the Commerce Clause? Now, the last mm -hmm. time we talked about this, um, we discussed some of the intricacies of the Rage case and this goes clear back to a case from, uh, I think, 1941, Wickard versus Filburn. And we found ourselves in a situation that is not totally um, dissimilar from what we have today. Up until the New Deal, the United States Supreme Court was a very conservative body when it came to interstate commerce. Our Constitution in Article 1, Section 8, in Clause 3, gives the federal government specific authority for interstate commerce or commerce amongst the states. In the era of the Articles of Confederation, the states, because there was no federal government telling them no, they would set up at their borders uh, tariff collection. So if you took uh, products out of a state, you might have to pay a, an exit tariff. And if you brought it into a state, you may have to pay an import tariff. And this was just disastrous for commerce. So when the Constitution was written, it was specifically put into the, uh, the express powers of the federal government to regulate commerce amongst the states. That's the language they use. That's been interpreted as interstate. If it doesn't cross the state line, the federal government should not be able to trigger jurisdiction. Unfortunately, in Article 1, Section 8 is also the necessary and proper clause, and that's where shit went off the rails. Now, back in the um, New Deal era, FDR was very troubled that the Supreme Court kept throwing out his uh, his big plans as being unconstitutional. There was no federal constitutional basis for it. And so uh, when he won his second term, he threatened to pack the court. Now, if you haven't been paying attention lately, there's, there's questions out there about whether they want to increase the number of justices from nine to 12 or some additional number. And this is what FDR threatened to do. The Congress wouldn't go through with it in the 1930s, but one of the justices, the conservative justices on the court had a change of mind. I remember his name was Owen Roberts and he flipped from being conservative to progressive. And now the Supreme Court started to uphold um, some of the uh, legislation that was pushed by FDR that quite frankly, it seems to be outside the power of the federal government per the constitution. So finally, in I think 1941, they decided Wickard versus Filburn where they decided that you can tell a farmer he can't grow his own personal wheat to feed his family and his cows um, because the cumulative effect of that is gonna have an impact on interstate commerce. Therefore, they took the necessary and proper clause and stretched it so far that it seems to take away states' rights. Okay. That was the, the case that really you know, put a lump in a lot of people's throats. And then in, 19, in 2005, the Rage case came out of the Supreme Court, and that case you know, took the Wickard versus Filburn case uh, to another extreme and claimed that because the federal government had a nationwide prohibition against marijuana, that the federal government, through the Necessary and Proper Clause, could um, prohibit intrastate, strictly in the state, non-commercial activity, 
uh, which is what Angel Rach and Diane Monson were proposing to do, grow their own weed in their backyard, use it in their house for medical purposes, never leave the state, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the Supreme Court took the Wickard versus Filburn decision and created another abomination here and said, well, you know, we're going to, we're going to find that the federal government has the power to prohibit even intrastate non-commercial activities because the impacts on, on interstate commerce are great enough. I don't know if there's any actual evidence of that. That was just what the story out of the federal government. But now what we have is a case where this, they have brought on high level attorneys um, to represent them. They seem to be funded and they understand that the goal here is to get to the Supreme Court. And one of the things I've talked about before is Clarence Thomas in the uh, Rage case is railed against it. We have this thing called the 10th Amendment. And the way it reads is that if a power is not specifically given to the federal government or prohibited to the states, the power belongs to the states and the people. Flip it around, the states and the people have all the power unless the federal government is specifically given a power in the Constitution or it's prohibited to the states. So I like that position more that this is a government of the people and by the people and the federal government is a is a constitutionally restricted power. Okay. So now we have the situation we have now where since Rach, um, the federal government under Obama put out the coal memo and decided that, well, it's just not, we don't want you going after these state medical marijuana programs if the, um, the actors are in compliance with state law. Okay. Oh, that's the situation we have right now. It's hard to argue with a state fa the straight face. There's still a strict federal prohibition across the nation in marijuana when so many states are allowing intrastate commerce for marijuana. It's just hard to uphold that. So this case is headed towards the Supreme Court ultimately. And it hopefully, I mean, my hope is that they just poke a hole in this argument and throw out the federal government's power over marijuana under the Interstate Commerce Clause to regulate what goes on inside of a state. I do not have a problem if your intention is to move it across the state line from the gate or you get caught moving marijuana across the state line. I think that clearly is within federal territory and you should not be allowed to do it um, under the current scheme. But stopping some state from uh, being able to have its own um, co commercial enterprises to manufacture, distribute, and dispense marijuana, I don't think the federal government should be involved. Now, this has taken place just three days after this DEA rescheduling hearing, and the government's already, you know, whining and sniveling, this is going to screw up our chances for rescheduling. My personal opinion, I don't give a shit. I think rescheduling is a horrible idea, not happen, and this is, may just be another excuse for the DEA to drag its feet. But I don't think the courts are going to be so inclined. This court we have right now, six of the justices line up with Clarence Thomas. But we get this decision or we get this situation in front of this current Supreme Court. I don't think they're going to be um, ruling the way that the Rakes decision did. In fact, I think they're going to throw out these premises. And I think they should. The federal government should not be allowed to interfere in the state's experiments at things like marijuana. What's also coming up is psychedelics. That's another area where I don't think the federal government should be involved in this if the state is experimenting with it, as long as it's not crossing state lines. We'll continue to monitor this, uh, and I'll bring you updates as we go along. I'm going to throw this back at you for your comments and, and your thoughts for this morning. What do you guys have to say? This is I'm with you, Dale. I, I I want this to make it all the way to the Supreme Court all the way all day, because I totally agree with you that with the justices that we have in place right now, we will definitely get a favorable ruling and uh, much love to Clarence Thomas on that, because we, we know that he is not a fan of any of this crap. Yeah, well. It's, I mean, the Rage case was, you know, in my opinion, an abomination. I got arrested they, two they weeks after. They should have never even went and brought those that medical necessity argument. And we, we, we told them not to way back then. And we, we, we knew it was going to have detrimental con consequences for, for, for a period of time. And, and, and it has. Well, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. There were a lot of things I, I didn't support. And in hindsight, I think there were mistakes. Uh, I mean, Jeff Jones was trying to everything he could uh, break through the federal monopoly on mm-hmm. marijuana back in the early part of the um, the, de- the century here. And, you know, it's hard to fault him, uh, but it did screw a lot of things him. up. I wasn't saying it to fault him. Well, we, we have not found a successful strategy. Mm-hmm. And as much as I disagree with some of the things that this court has said, I, I disagree with the immunity decision. I think that was an abomination. Um, but I, I told Dale Geringer from Cal Normal the mm-hmm. last time I saw him that I think this court would be poised to throw the rage decision in the trash. We may get something good out of them for cannabis mm-hmm. because it is, in my opinion, an abomination. It stretches the, the Commerce Clause to the point where it subsumes the Tenth Amendment. And we have mm-hmm. a specific amendment that says these rights belong to the states. And the Commerce Clause specifically states it's only between the states, not within the states. But we've got this problem that is on the books, and there have been a couple of, of attempts since um, – well, in the last, say, 50 years to rein this in, there was a case called Lopez with you know, the gun-free um, school zone case. There was another one called Sullivan. It was a you know, domestic violence case. And the court said, what the fuck does that have to do with interstate commerce? Mm-hmm. Get it out of here. They threw it in the trash. Okay? I'm hoping that they will take the same approach now. Look at this. And this, if it stays within you know, New York or California or Colorado, what the hell business does the federal government have in that? Unless you're just going to give them the power to do anything they want because something at some point crosses a state line. Mm-hmm. I think that's an abomination of the Constitution. Fair, fair, fair enough. And, 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 and Rochelle, I think you, you wrote a piece on this also for Green State. What do you think about all this? Yeah, that's correct. What I find interesting about this um, is the Department of Justice hemming and hawing that this is going to frustrate rescheduling and that whole process and the fact that this hearing is taking place just a couple of days after the big rescheduling hearing that the mm-hmm. DEA has put out. So it's interesting to see this infighting in the government, of course, about how this is all going to play out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, it seems more like blame shifting because obviously, hopefully the reschedule doesn't pass. Prayerfully, it doesn't pass, right? But when it doesn't, they're going to be like, well, this is why. Good point, Jenny. Good point. Mm-hmm. Stone, well, but th- there's no reason why you can't take um, THC, which is already a, a scheduled narcotic, mm-hmm. if, if you want to say that, the Dronabinol, the Marinol, those kinds of things, and allow naturally sourced THC to be part of a medication that could be higher in in uh, potency than what you can buy at these typical uh, retail stores in states. I don't have a problem with that. Mm-hmm. Same thing happens with Motrin. If you want to get 800 milligram Motrin, you can't buy it at the store. You got to get a prescription for it. Okay, mm-hmm. there is precedence for some of this stuff, but I think that marijuana fit or cannabis fits closer to the alcohol model than it does to your traditional narcotic drug model, and that's where it should be. And then if you want to co-opt it and have high potency THC in a in a prescribed medication, God love you. You know, mm-hmm. but get the fuck out of our business and leave us alone. Fair, fair, fair enough. What do you think about this, Stone? I know you want interstate trade out there in Texas. Um, I like, I like, I like Dale's take. Man, I really hope, I would love to see this make it to the Supreme Court. I'm not, I'm not gonna hold my breath. You're not gonna hold your breath, huh? No, I'll run out of air. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Maybe you'll have to move to Montana because, you know, that's big sky area up there. Hey, probably mm-hmm. not. <laughs> well, I, I suspect that the court would take it up because no, neither one of these parties is going to stop at this at this district court. I mean, at these uh, appellate court level, you, the one that loses is going to appeal. And I think the Supreme Court would grant certiorari. That's what you do. Mm-hmm. You file for a, a writ of certiorari to ask them to review it. And I think they're poised right now to strike some of this nonsense that's gone over over the last 50 to 60, maybe 70 years and rein some of this stuff in. That's just my own opinion. 
you know, I, 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 I agree with that to some degree, Dale. I know I've talked with a, a few friends of mine that are Supreme Court lawyers, and uh, and they, they all agree that uh, as well that if this if this thing makes it up to the Supreme Court that, you know, but we, we ultimately will probably get a favorable ruling. So hopefully it does. And uh, we're, we're rooting for him. And, and thanks. Thanks to all these lawyers that are that are working on this. That is that is for sure. Without a doubt. Do you have any any final statements on this, Jenny Beth? Nope. All right, fair enough. We're going to roll into a commercial and we're going to be right back. <laughs> 